people love the idea that success is complicated because it makes them feel really good about when they fall down, right? And they love wrapping that little warm blanket of mediocrity around themselves and saying, oh my God, man, I just, it was just, and it's just not, it's just not. I mean, you can tell yourself that and you can be right, uh, or you can dust yourself off and, and figure out how to really solve problems in an elegant and simple way and just get rich and happy. You get to be right either way. You decide the outcome. Cannot agree with that more. I'm excited to get right into this episode, but before we do, make sure to drop down below, leave a five-star written review. Uh, it's going to help us rank in the system. It's going to help us get in front of more people like yourself that are going to gain value from episodes uh, where we interview incredible elite entrepreneurs and thought leaders like Kent Clothier, uh, bringing actionable, tangible steps and things that you can apply into your day-to-day -day business or life to benefit you. Thanks so much, guys. Let's get right into it. So we'll start off, man, just by asking you. I know you got a lot going on, Kent. What's exciting in your world uh, today? Um, I mean, it's still, it's clearly an exciting time to be in real estate. I can tell you that for a lot of different reasons, probably the, you know, the mar market is, is white hot. You would have to be a moron to lose money in this market. Um, but with all that going on, kind of been here, done that, seeing how this, this story actually ends and knowing that there is a correction that's coming sooner rather than later, uh, because the markets run in 12 to 14 year cycles. And we're kind of already past that point. So we know we're we're overdue and kind of staring it right in the face. And so in anticipation of that, you know, I'm pretty excited about the, the fact that we're really focusing a lot of our time, effort, and energy on the seller finance side of the business, which I think that is a massive, massive opportunity that quite frankly, most people won't take the time to, to understand, um, which means it's a lot less competitive and a lot more profitable. So I'm really, really pumped about that opportunity that's sitting out there right now. That's awesome, man. And I do want to take a deeper dive into that aspect of it, the seller finance piece, because you're saying that it is an opportunity that is going underappreciated. Uh, but for context, for those of you just tuning in, we are live with Kent Clothier. Am I pronouncing that right? I want to make sure I'm pronouncing that right. Kent you Clothier. It, man. That's it. Yes, sir. And I know you've built many businesses ranging from a few million dollars to over a billion dollars. Um, so you've, you've done a lot of shit. So my first question to ask somebody who's doing a lot of things is always when someone asks you what you do, Kent, how do you self-identify? Cause you can take that answer in so many different directions. I am a serial entrepreneur, my friend. That is what I am. First and foremost, I could give a shit what the, uh, what the widget is. If there's a way to build a business. And by the way, there's a huge difference between a, um, you know, a side hustle or a hobby and a business. So I'm talking about actually building a real business. If there's an opportunity to build a business, help some people and make a lot of money in the process. I'm, I'm usually uh, one of the first, one, first ones to step up and try to figure out how I can uh, get involved and bring value to the equation. Now, how do you differentiate between a side hustle and a real business? Well, listen, I mean, there's nothing against side hustles. Um, it's, it's the way almost every entrepreneur has to start, right? You got to get super passionate about making some money and getting out there and figuring out a way to do that. Uh, the, the huge gap is that it's very simple to figure out whether you own a business or not. And that is just stop, leave, go on vacation for a month. Don't tell anybody. And when you come back, if the whole thing hasn't burnt to the ground, well, then you probably got something that looks like a business. Um, but if you leave, come back, hasn't burnt to the ground, and you have more money in your bank account than when you left, then you certainly have a business. Anything short of that, your ass owns a job. And because if you have to show up, you have to do things that, that are clearly dependent on you about driving revenue, then you've got some work to do. And um, so I'm, 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 extremely passionate about building things that I can get out of the way. I can put people and processes and systems and automation in place that can kind of take over what, we, what we're doing and, and scale it to places that most would never even think to scale. Um, and then, you know, getting paid along the way and helping a lot of people along the way. So that's, that's the way I define a side hustle. Look, there's plenty of people that have figured out how to make a lot of money. They, uh, they make really good incomes, you know? high six figures, seven figure incomes every year. They have not figured out how to turn it into a business that doesn't need them, number one. And they certainly haven't figured out how to turn it into real wealth. And so those are two things that, uh, you know, later on in my life, I've gotten very, very good at and passionate about. And, and that's the big distinction that I make. Again, 
nothing against hustling because we all, all mm. have had to do it and, and continue to do it in some level. But I think um, if you if you're really honest with yourself and you sit down and say, man, you know, what is my mission? I'll, I'll tell you exactly what everybody should mission. Everybody's mission should be, and it should be very simple, um, to create options for yourself. Mm -hmm. If you have the option of showing up or not, um, you have the option of traveling around the world or not, and nothing stops in your business, uh, that's a good place to be. And as long as you're focused on creating options for yourself, then you're, you're probably on the right track. It sounds like you're speaking a lot about how Robert Kiyosaki talks about, say, the cash flow quadrant, where if you're in the S quadrant, you're essentially self-employed or owning a job but you're not able to walk away because you don't have that scale. It's one-to-one. -one. But once you start building systems and processes and leveraging the help of others, uh, that's when you're now in the B quadrant, uh, which is what you've done very successfully. Now, how did you learn all this, Ken? I know you come from an entrepreneurial family. What did, what did your parents do? Well, yeah, like you alluded to, I started, you know, I started in the grocery industry, in fact, with my father when I was in my early teens. And then, um, grew up in that business and then turned it into an arbitrage business in the same industry um, and ultimately took that company um, by the time I was 30 to doing $1.8 billion a year, seventh largest privately held company in the state of Florida, um, exited that company and then, you know, took a, a really kind of dramatic turn, 180 degrees opposite of anything that looked like success and um, failed miserably at setting up my next business and to the point where it almost bankrupted me. Quite frankly, it should have bankrupted me, but I was too proud to actually file the paperwork. Um, and which ultimately led me to real estate. And so when I got into real estate, I started as a hustler. All I was doing was flipping houses, man, trying to not be broke anymore. I uh, was kind of fed up with, with being fed up. And so I got really good at it. And then kind of had that same epiphany that I just alluded to here that, man, I, if I, I had a new little girl on the way and if I, didn't, if I didn't figure out a way to automate, if I didn't figure out a way to put processes and people in place, then you know, I was going to miss out on some of the best years of my young daughter's life. And I, it was just highly motivating to me to not make that mistake again, because I had made that mistake in my 20s with my young son. Mm -hmm. I had um, built a really big business and was super passionate about it, but it was always at the expense of friends and family. I was going, going, going. Um, and so when you get really, when you have a big goal in life, and the goal for me was I was not going to make that mistake again, and I was going to be a present father and a present husband and a present friend and son and all that kind of good stuff. Um, there's only one way to do that, man. You got to own your own time. And mm -hmm. that's where all this stuff comes in play. And, uh, you know, like the sign behind me and on my wrist and everywhere else is, it's all about time. I want to get the most out of it that I can. And so I just became a real student of business. And I started looking at every possible place that I could fire myself inside of my business and putting, mm. you know, making the investments, doing the things, finding the leverage points. And you look up and almost 20 years later, and yeah, you figure out a few things. And those, those formulas have continued to work over and over and over again, regardless of what we step into. I love it, man. Yeah, I was looking at the timeline uh, on your website of, of your business ventures along the way, and it just looks like a very natural evolution where you, you start in one area, then you identify a need within that niche, and then you say, well, hey, let's put something together for that, a, a marketing company, uh, what have you. So that's, I, I love how you've, you've done that. Um, but to, to, to bring it back to uh, when you transitioned out of the grocery industry, you had built one of the, you said the seventh largest business in the state of Florida. Yeah. So from the outside looking in, I'm guessing a lot of people would have said like, man, this guy's made it. He's built a billion dollar company, but you weren't happy with that. What, what made you want to leave that? Was it the time that you didn't have when you were going? No, I was, I was, I was, I um, was, I was a product of my own success, right? So, you know, you gotta almost have to put yourself in the, in the same mentality that I was in. And I started a business when I was 17 and, and then in 13 years, it had gone from 10 million to 40 million to 80 million to 250 million to 800 million to 1.8 billion, right? So along that way, um, you know, you, you believe your own bullshit. I, I was a hundred percent somebody that believed that everything that I touched would turn to gold because I had no other point of reference to tell me differently, right? Mm -hmm. I had just basically always been very, very, very successful. And so you know, I got into a run-in with my partners um, on March 14th of 2000, and we got into a small disagreement, 
probably didn't last three minutes, but it was enough for me being in that headspace that I was like, you know what, guys, I'm out of here. I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore with you guys. I'm just going to go do it on my own. Peace out. And it was as sudden and as poorly thought out as that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, heat of, you know, in the moment, super frustrated, pissed off, whatever you want to call it, and just walked out of there in a huff, thought I was going to go build a competitive business and I'd be up and running in the next six months and, you know, crushing my former partners in their own business. And that just did not work For, out. Former that. partner still being your dad? Was he still uh, one no, of the No, no, no. He was no longer involved in the business. No. Got it. Um, and so we, um, you know, we went toe to toe for many years and ultimately I, I drained bank accounts trying to fight my way through all that stuff and navigate my way. All, and ultimately, like I said, basically bankrupted me in every possible way you could describe that, not only financially, but, you know, all the relationships, all the business relationships, everything. And so it wasn't uh, a well thought out, hey, strategic, I'm going to go leave. It was just being so full of shit that uh, I thought, you know, money grew on trees and I just walk out of there and go reproduce all my success all over again because I was a product of that, right? I was, I was very jaded in that moment. Mm -hmm. But it was, the, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. I mean, it took me uh, 10 years to get back to anything that seemed like... Um, any level of success again, but I can tell you that the, the taste of success is much sweeter the second time around. And I'm much more appreciative of it and learned valuable lessons all the way back up. You know, now I've been in the real estate game for almost 20 years and um, become a high profile, uh, you know, person in that space. And uh, I'm very, very grateful for every, you know, everything that's, that's happened to me, including the bad stuff. I mean, I'm, very, I'm fortunate that it happened to me at such a young age. I shouldn't say happened to me. It happened for me. Mm. Um, at such a young age that I could recover and learn the lessons and do it better the second time. Yeah, that, that's such a major concept that life happens for you, not to you. Um, and when you view it that way, everything becomes a leverage point as opposed to a detriment to your success. No doubt. That's awesome to hear. So what were some of those major takeaways? I know uh, I, my personal takeaways from that are um, never believe your own headlines. The, the moment you th think you made it, you're you're probably heading back in the other direction. Um, and that rock bottom is always going to teach you more lessons than success ever will. So what, what were your big paradigm shifts where you 180'd on um, in that Probably the biggest life? single shift that, I, that changed me was I was, and there's a lot of people that fall victim to this, right? Especially at the end, when you're in your entrepreneurial journey that, um, you know, when you're in your uh, teens and 20s, you're so full of crap that you don't even realize it. And that's just for all of us, you know, and, at least in my own experience. And um, I was the guy that got to the office at six o'clock in the morning. I did not leave till eight o'clock at night. Nobody was going to outwork me. Nobody was going to outperform me. And, and all of that led was a, you know, was a huge factor in how successful I was. Um, but it was all at the expense of something at a great cost to me. Right. Um, you know, I, I had a wife at home. I had a young son at home and they rarely saw me. And I conned myself into believing, well, I'm doing this for them, which is the biggest lie on the planet. Um, and then you look up and if and when it all crumbles to the ground, I can assure you that anybody that had your back on the way up, they're certainly not going to have it on the way down. And that's a really good thing to remember, right? Everybody that loves you on the way up, we all love a good train wreck. Every one of us. This is a re you know, you hear celebrities talk about it or sports stars talk about it, that go take 30 seconds and you can go find some headline where the media is trying to take somebody down right now. Right. Um, mm. Somebody is starting, somebody's, somebody said something or did something and everybody can't wait to just completely shit all over them. Um, mm. And so that's just the world we live in. And I experienced that firsthand. And so the, the reset for me was, look, man, uh, I know I can do it the wrong way. I, the next time around, I want to do it the right way. I want to make sure that I'm taking care of my family first, taking care of my friends, that I'm uh, uh, building a business that that allows me the time and the opportunity to do what I want to do when I want to do it. If I don't want to walk in the door until noon because I'm out, you know, playing with my little girls or, or walking them to school or anything I want to do, I'm that's that's the most important thing that I could ever do is be the guy that is super super present. People get caught up thinking this is about money, and I can tell you it's not. It is almost certainly about time. You know, when you're on your deathbed, you are not going to sit there and say, man, I just wish I made more money, but you will almost certainly be there saying, I just wish I had more time. And that is very, very profound for me. It is front and center with everything I do that I, I want 
to be extremely present with the people that matter in my life. So I build businesses that allow me the opportunity and the freedom to do that. Um, and that's, that's the, the, the single biggest lesson I walked out of it with. I could easily go and pour my heart and soul and go build another billion dollar business and, you know, make all the sacrifices all over again. But I figured out exactly what the right balance is. I can be wildly successful. In fact, I would argue even more successful uh, now than I've ever was before. And I can also be a really successful human being along the way. That's awesome, man. So before we move past this season of life, because I'm so intrigued by it, I mean, it's not often you meet people who have built billion dollar companies. It sounds like you fucked a lot of things up, but you also did a lot of things right, obviously, to scale oh, from sure. an eight sure. figure business to a 10 figure It wasn't all business. bad, I can tell you, man. You don't, you don't get to build a 10 figure company by the time you're 30 years old by being a total shit show. It doesn't happen like that, right? For sure. You gotta, you gotta, have, it, you gotta have some stuff. So I, I mean, you cannot appreciate the light without having some of the dark. Everything mm -hmm. in my life at that point was all nothing but light. I didn't understand what was wrong until the dark came, right? And so when it got, got there, all of a sudden I appreciated everything and knew if I ever had the chance to get back on top, it would be done with a lot more light and dark involved. For sure. One of the favorite lessons I've learned was you hear a lot about this concept of work-life balance or just balance in life. And I think the best explanation I heard was you want to think of balance in the macro, the long term, uh, as opposed to in the short term, where you can live a very unbalanced life for a season where you're, you're building your foundation, you're, uh, you know, you're rising to the top, it's all systems go so that in the next half of your life, in the next season, you can, um, you know, take your foot off the gas if you want. And then that's where like the lifetime balance comes in. Um, but back to the things you did right during the season where you built a, a billion dollar company, uh, what do you attribute that to? I know you're big on this concept of reverse wholesaling. Is that where that mindset kind of came in? Um, during this yeah, time? I mean, it was probably even more broad than that, you know, because reverse wholesaling was something I did in the arbitrage business, which I'll, I'll tell you about in just a second. But then sure. I also kind of did the same thing in the real estate business. And in both cases, it just happened to work magnificently. Um, but it, it really goes up even one level above that. And um, the idea and the concept is question everything, right? The, the, there's a lot of elegance and simplicity. There's a lot of people that go through and make things really, really challenging. And for the life of me, I have no idea why people do that. Even, in, even in when they're in hustler mode, you'll find people that won't invest a dollar in marketing. They would much rather drive up and down the street and knock on doors to find houses, right? The hardest way you could possibly do something um, mm. or they'll do, you know, whatever it is, right? And it, it's indicative of a lack of knowledge, ignorance. I don't know what it is, but, but the bottom line is, is, I'm looking for the most elegant solution to solve the problem because I want to scale. And in the real estate business, you know, we were, we were doing $800 million a year. Uh, when I finally took the reins and said, I got it, I'll, I'll, I'm going to control this thing. And, you know, it was a really simple concept. We were doing, like I said, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, but our, but our business model was when somebody would, pick up the phone and call us and say, hey, Kent, we have 50 trucks of Tide detergent sitting in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Will you buy it from us? Well, we would tell, they'd say, hey, I want to sell for $50 a case, for instance. Um, and then I would get on the phone, or our team or hundreds of employees would get on the phone and try to go sell those trucks as fast as we could, right? Go sell it for $75, $80 a case somewhere in the United States so we could arrange for transportation and get it done. The challenge with that is they didn't just call me. They called you know, a half a dozen other people as well. And so now I've got competitors that are trying to sell the exact same product and they're trying to sell it to the exact same customers. So now it's a race to zero. It's like mm -hmm. who can pay the most and who can afford to sell it for the least, right? And you're getting pinched on both sides. And so for me as you know, a guy in my 20s coming in like, what the hell are we doing? Why would we do it this way? Why don't we just go ask every single grocery company in the United States if I could sell you anything at any price and deliver it at any quantity into any city, what do you want to buy from me? Sure. Tell me exactly what you want. Start with the end in mind. And when they would give us this information, hundreds of millions of dollars in potential orders, we would just work the deal backwards. And suddenly we were calling up people and saying, hey, you can find me 10 trucks of, uh, you know, Nestle water, I can buy it for $12 a case, go make a phone call. 
And what was happening because of that is while everybody was fighting over the same 50 trucks of, you know, whatever, we're over here creating hundreds and hundreds of trucks of opportunities on stuff that nobody ever even knew was, was going on. And, you know, that one little inkling took us from 800 million to 1.8 billion in 30 months. Nice. And so you fast forward into the real estate space. And when I got in the real estate space, everybody was taught to do it exactly the same way. You know, basically go out and find a property. Go find somebody that needs to sell really bad. Go get it under contract at some ridiculously discounted price. And then just go shake the trees and find somebody to buy it from. And my concept was, was again, what the hell are we doing? Um, why don't I just go find every single person in any market that is paying all cash for houses? Because those are clearly investors and they mm -hmm. make about 35% of the market. I'll just go market to them, get them to pick up the phone, call me. I'll treat them like royalty. Tell me exactly what you want in any neighborhood, what price you're trying to pay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'll get, let's just call it hundreds of opportunities for people like this is the exact types of properties I want to buy. Effectively, now I'm speaking on behalf of tens of millions of dollars in purchases. And from a marketing standpoint, it gets really easy to go shopping effectively for sure. an opportunity, creating an opportunity where you already know you got a buyer lined up if you need it versus me putting something under contract and hoping I get it sold. And, you know, as the saying goes, hope is not a strategy. And so yep. we started teaching people how to do that. And before you knew it, not only did it blow up our business and, you know, we do 800 flips a year right now, but it blew up a lot of other people's business over the last 15 years. Elegantly simple beginning with the end in mind. I love it. Straight out of the seven habits of highly effective people. If you ain't read that book, very good book. It's like when I was a kid, I learned very quickly that um, when I'm doing these little maze puzzles, it was easier to start at the end and work it backwards. Who would have known that that was a very effective business strategy? I love it, man. In, in marketing, everybody's looking for the bottom 3% when the rest of the people in the buying cycle are the other 97%. Nobody goes after the 97, they pay top dollar for the 3%. Right. Mm -hmm. Just do what others aren't doing, quite frankly. Yep. And again, it doesn't have to be revolutionary. It can be just a simple concept. I mean, you would have thought that I discovered the cure to cancer when I brought this out. I was like, well, you know, what are we talking about here? I mean, <laughs> just go talk to everybody who's buying houses right now, writing checks, right? No banks involved. These guys are writing checks, it means they are investors. They want to buy lots of houses right now. And every market in the United States um, and find out exactly what they want. And then when you're out there marketing, just go create the very opportunity that they want to buy from you. If I know somebody wants to pay me $200,000 for a house, how much easier is it for me? If I know not only what they want to pay, the neighborhood they want to be in, et cetera, I'll just focus all of my marketing on creating an opportunity for me to buy it at 150 and go make that 50 points on the deal all day long. And is this the concept that you built a software on to find these investors? That's exactly right. So when I, when I brought it out, I, we created a piece of software that goes out and finds every cash buyer in any market uh, in the United States instantaneously, because what most people probably don't realize is that every time you do a real estate transaction, it's a matter of public record. So we go and mine data and we can sit there and tell you any person in any zip code, exactly what they bought, the price they paid, you know, where they, what their mailing address is, phone number, email, everything. And here's everybody that's paying cash in any market. And then also on the flip side, here's everybody that owns a vacant house or a house in foreclosure or is going through a divorce or whatever the case may be. Again, all these public filings. And, you know, we teach people to just to get in the middle of that, connect the two dots, be the matchmaker. Hey, I got buyers that want to buy. I got sellers that want to sell. Let me get in the middle of it. It's a you know, what you're looking for is, is very inefficient marketplaces. And real estate is extremely inefficient marketplace, ex especially on the, on the investment side. Mm -hmm. um, there's no way that you can just go off and you know, if you wanted to buy a thousand houses today in, in a particular market, there's literally no way you could go and make that happen instantaneously. You're going to have to work with people. You're going to have to work relationships. You're going to have to do marketing. And so trying to connect those dots and create some efficiencies has been, you know, something that we've kind of specialized in. So where did the idea to start a software company around it though, as opposed to just taking this information and leveraging it for yourself? I mean, well, first off I did both. Um, you know, like I said, we buy and sell 800 properties a year. Um, mm -hmm. Even if we wanted to go and do 10,000 a year, uh, there's more meat on the bone than we could ever get to. 
just to put it in perspective, there are 170,000 cash transactions every month in the United States on single family homes. So it is a massive, massive marketplace. And when I started teaching people what I was doing, one of the biggest hangups is that, you know, me teaching them to go down to the county courthouse and, and dig up this data was just not going to be efficient. Um, they just simply wouldn't do it. And I'm just not in the business of telling somebody how to do something and then not seeing them successful. So we put the software in for ourselves first. And then once we you know, had our software that was doing this for us, we decided to productize it and bring it out to the market and say, look, this is how we do it. I'm just gonna make it easy for you. And so in 2008, we launched the cash buyer component of it. And then a few years later, we launched the motivated seller side of it where they had an opportunity to marry those two things together right in a piece of software. And since then there's been many, many iterations of competitors come over the top of us and say, you know, hey, here's our version of this, et cetera, et cetera, which to me is a, a massive compliment that we sure. were, you know, um, but, you know, you can either have that scarcity mentality and sit there and, and say, hey, I want it all and you'll never get it all. Or you can try to help some people unlock their potential and connect some dots for them and show them the, the clear path. And I'm just more, much more, um, passionate about door number two than I've ever been about door number one. Nice. So you started multiple projects here. What, what's your method of operation whenever you're launching a new concept, say a, a, a software? I mean, I imagine you're not a programmer. So what did you do? Or maybe you are, I don't know that about you, but what um, did you do when you decided you want to start a, a tech company in essence? Um, first off, I didn't, you know, let's just be clear. That's not what I was trying to do. I, I, I wanted a tool inside of our own business that made us more efficient. Right. And so we were doing things very, very manually, but being very, very successful at it. We were throwing people at a problem. And then we decided, man, there's gotta be a way that potentially we can speed this up and keep in mind this in 2008. Right. So we were, we hired programmers, a programmer, I should say, to effectively go and scrape records off of a off of a county assessor's website, one county at a time, uh, which you couldn't ask for a slower way to do something. But we were we were in a game that that nobody else was willing to play in. We were doing we were solving a big problem for us first, mm. um, and then ultimately once we showed a few people what we're doing, they're like, "Hey man, I would I would like access to it." And lo, before you knew it, we had thousands of people paying us for access to this software. Um, it's nothing I ever set out to do, nothing I, I never set out to be in the software space, I never set out to be in the education space, I never set out to run masterminds, I never set out to do any of that stuff. Uh, all that stuff just kind of came organically as uh, people, you know, when, you know you're on the right path when people are coming to you and asking you a very simple question, how the hell are you doing what you're doing? Sure. Um, and when you're getting those types of questions, then you probably have the beginnings of, of, a, of a business, right? People are, people are willing to pay for efficiency. They're willing to pay to get the result faster. And so once we, once we see those opportunities and we understand that you know, there's a marketplace for it and people, there's a demand for it, then we're pretty quick to uh, figure out what the A business model, not necessarily the right business model, but we're, we'll, we'll move quick and uh, start to see if, again, our whole core, our whole culture is can we help people and make money doing it, right? And so- if we can do those two things, then we're usually in the game and, and willing to start taking some steps in that direction. I, I love your approach, Ked, because I'm over here trying to dig for like some crazy, deep, elaborate answer. But as, as you said, the the simplicity is what is elaborate. And you're basically a guy who just comes off to me as, hey, there's a problem. Let's fix it and bring that value to the world. You come from a very organic place of wanting to serve and help others. So, I mean, to me, that validates why you've been able to accomplish the things that you have. So well, I, dude, I, I guarantee you, like if I was to look at you guys' business, that there's some problem you have in your business right now because everybody does. For sure. And what you have to understand is that, you know, uh, being an entrepreneur is a lonely sport, right? We get trapped in our own four walls and it's, we, we believe for one reason or another that this is my problem and it's only my problem. The reality of it is, is there's not a problem that you have or that I have that somebody else hasn't already come across the solution to. Not one, right? You got to keep in mind, there's 7 billion people on this planet, right? Um, and so if somebody has those answers and somebody's tackled that before, I find a lot of comfort in, in knowing that um, 
I am probably very indicative of a lot of people that are suffering from the same disease. If I'm suffering and trying to solve this and I come up with a solution, I wonder if there are other people out there that are looking for the same type of solution. And I think that inquisitive uh, opportunity there, understanding that it's a, it's a big world out there, right? Um, you'll start to find that your products and your services start to reveal themselves really quickly. I mean, it's not complex. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, you look at people that, going back to our conversation earlier, just on some of the hustles, um, I mean, you see these guys that are, I was just watching, I don't know, it's on Instagram or TikTok or something, somebody talking about, you know, a guy that goes to Marshall's and buys um, overstock products, whatever the heck it is, he's buying them at a discount, buy a pallet, and then comes and rips all the tags and sends them off to Amazon. And, you know, that's, he's probably making $10,000 a month doing that, which I applaud. Nice. And then you got a guy that comes right behind him and says, man, you know, here's what I do. I go and I scan the item. I load it in Amazon site. I find a, a drop shipper and I've got, I get the entire process automated. And instead of doing $10,000 a month, I'm doing $400,000 a month. Nice. That guy solved a real problem because he didn't want to go to stores anymore. And that's kind of what I, where, I, where I go with that. There's, you may not understand the problem, but I can assure you if there's something that's giving you a little bit of pain, a little bit of resistance in your business and you solve it, there's somebody out there that's willing to learn from you. For sure, man. And again, simplicity is the key. I think people like to complicate things because if something's complicated and you fail at it, you can blame the complexity of the situation. Bro, but if, something is, right out of my mouth. if something is simple and you fail at it, you only have yourself to look at in the mirror and people don't like. People love the idea that success is complicated because it makes them feel really good about when they fall down. Mm -hmm. Right. And they love wrapping that little warm blanket of mediocrity around themselves and saying, <laughs> Oh my God, man, I was just, it was just, and it's just not, it's just not. I mean, you can tell yourself that and you can be right. Uh, or you can dust yourself off and, and figure out how to really solve problems in an elegant and simple way and just get rich and happy. You get to be right either way. You decide the outcome. A hundred percent, man. So Yes, agreed. So this is all the mindset stuff that you have to have as your foundation before going into business. So let, let's talk actually now about uh, real estate as a business. What, what would your advice be to anyone looking to get into uh, uh, real estate investing in whatever capacity that is buying and, or wholesaling, uh, flipping? Well, if you're new to, if you're new to the game, get involved in wholesaling for sure. Uh, it's the lowest barrier of entry. Uh, does not require a license, does not require, I mean, the only state that it requires a license in is the state of Illinois. Um, it is, you know, extremely um, lucrative. Um, it could easily be defined, at, at certainly starting off as a hustle. But there are new systems and technology, including our own, that just connect so many dots so quickly. I mean, you can get yourself trained for a few hundred bucks you know, by myself or somebody else and become a, an expert in a matter of less than a month. Um, and then with software tools and, and that you can easily market in any market um, and start doing deals and, you know, in a lot of cases in less than 90 days. Be very hard pressed to find another way to get into real estate that fast and, and effectively and in a knowledgeable way, right? Now, with all that being said, wholesaling, until it gets to scale, like what we do, uh, wholesaling is a hustle. It is a way you could easily go and produce a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. And in all likelihood, for most people listening, it's change your life, right? You start adding a couple hundred thousand dollars income stream to somebody, that, that's, that, that's, that's a good way to walk away from a nine to five or whatever the case may be. But it's not really a business yet. Sure. Um, turning it into a machine that does it, you know, effectively with or without you is, a, is the next natural evolution. And then ultimately taking some of those profits and becoming a real real estate investor where you are investing in assets and building wealth is the last kind of progression. Um, there are many people that are wholesalers that are, I would, I would argue the vast majority of wholesalers that are not real estate investors. Um, they are, they are guys or girls that are really good marketers and figure out how to put deals together. That's not investing. Investing is when you figure out how to create a return on your money passively. Um, and so 
that is the lowest barrier of entry. That's where I encourage anybody and everybody to get started. And I tell you what, I will certainly wouldn't do. There's two things I absolutely wouldn't do. If you are trying to figure out a way to make income and walk away from a nine to five or whatever the case may be, you know, start your entrepreneurial journey. Two things you don't do. You definitely don't go buy rental properties and you sure as hell don't start rehabbing properties, right? Mm -hmm. Because rental properties may uh, are in all likelihood at scale will create uh, wealth for you, but it's going to take 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, and if you go and start rehabbing, you know, a house, you watched Chip and jo Ga Joanna Gaines on TV and you saw them flip a house in 26 minutes and make a shit ton of money. <laughs> yeah, that's not reality, right? You mean it doesn't um, work like that every time, Ken? Yeah. This is, the, rehabbing is a very painful and expensive lesson if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, there are way too many parts for the average person off the street. Um, but if you want to learn the game, you want to get the vocabulary, you want to make money while you're doing it, uh, you want to get really accustomed to the whole transactional process, you want to understand all the really things that are important, understanding how to buy properties at a discount, how to sell properties. You want to get all that? Wholesaling is the key, man. Can you walk us through, for those who are, are not familiar with wholesaling or have heard it, just don't really know what it entails, can you just walk us through a typical wholesaling scenario for someone? Sure. The easiest way I could describe wholesaling is, let's see, I've got, all right, so I got this piece of paper here. So the easiest way I could describe it, and for, for those of you that are listening to it, I'm, I'm just holding up you know, a fake, let's just call it a lottery ticket in my hand. If I walk down the street here, I'm in La Jolla, California. If I walk down the street to the convenience store and I happen to buy a lottery ticket, right? And scratch that thing off and they told, you know, and the ticket was I won $30 million and they're gonna pay me a million dollars a year for the next 30 years. Well, what I would ask everybody to just think about for a second is that at the moment that I scratched that thing off and I won, what is the asset? At that exact moment, what is the asset? The asset is the ticket itself, mm. right? This thing entitles me to $30 million. Until I turn it in at the lottery office, this thing is extremely valuable. Can we all agree on that, right? Yeah. That's the reason why people go throw them into a safety deposit box or in a safe or whatever the case may be, because man, this thing is, this is life-changing right here. And so there are people that will step in with that ticket and they will come in and uh, JG Wentworth and all these companies, right? They will come in and say, Hey, Kent, we understand that you just scratched off a ticket and you're going to get $30 million over the next 30 years, a million dollars a year. We'll give you $20 million all cash today. We'll take your place in that ticket. We'll buy effectively your spot for $20 million. Mm -hmm. And I can take that $20 million today. And then what will happen is JG Wentworth or whoever it is knows that over the course of the next 30 years, they are going to get $30 million. They're gonna get a 50% return on their money. They're willing to wait, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Wholesaling is that exact scenario, but it's in houses. So if I go down the street right now and I go and I've got a neighbor, I've got somebody down the street, they're going through a divorce or you know, recently inherited a property or they're moving out of state, whatever the case may be. And I come in and I say to them, uh, I want to make you an offer on your house. Your house is worth 300 grand. I will pay you all cash for your house for $200,000. Now, I don't have $200,000, right? It's just, I mean, again, it's an example. I don't have $200,000, but what I'm doing is I'm creating that lottery ticket. A lottery ticket, yeah. right? I, what I'm doing is I'm creating a contract that says I'm entitled to buy this house for $200,000 that's worth 300 or more when somebody picks it up. And there are people in the world, these cash buyers that will immediately step in and buy my place in the, in the contract. They will come in and say, Kent, you got, a, you got a lottery ticket that says you're entitled to a house that's worth $300,000 and you pay 200. We'll give you $10,000 and take your spot in that contract right now. And I sign a one page document, effectively assigning my rights to the contract to somebody else to that buyer and when they show up at the closing table to buy the house the buyer shows up with two hundred and ten thousand dollars two hundred thousand dollars goes on the original contract the other ten thousand dollars gets wired into my bank account i never bought it i never paid for it i never i was just smart enough to get it under contract and that's the easiest way i can explain wholesaling to anybody is that 
That, uh, that type of transaction happens tens of thousands of times every single month all over the United States. That's when you hear people talk about, hey, you can flip houses with no money, no credit. That's exactly what they're talking about right there. So let's break down the components of that because uh, there's a few pieces there. You got the person willing to sell the house. You got the cash buyer of the house. So where does one find, first of all, let me ask you this way. Why would somebody want to sell their house for well below market value? Um, so let's start with that question first. Speed. Speed. So if you think about it, the average house uh, sits on the market for 78 days, right? Uh, and cost approximately between 17 and 22,000 in commissions and fees to sell, right? So I got to wait 78 days to get it sold, probably another 30 days to close it. I got to make three more payments of my $3,000 mortgage. I got to pay the utilities. I got to pay the insurance. I got to pay the taxes, right? I just lost my job. Um, I, don't, I can't do that. Oh, and by the way, my house needs $25,000 in repairs before I could even sell it on the MLS. Well, I can't write a $25,000 check. Um, and I sure as hell don't want to pay another $15,000 in, uh, you know, additional payments. And oh, by the way, when I get, and all that takes place, I actually don't want to take a $17,000 haircut in commissions and other fees. By the time I get done with all this stuff, it's cost me time. It's cost me money all the way around. You have to keep in mind that what we're talking about are people helping people out of distressful situations. Distress mm -hmm. happens every day. There's no shortage, especially in a, you know, in a COVID situation, but even prior to COVID, you know, if you think about it, just, it's just, again, back to the simplicity and the elegance of it. Um, we all have, we all have the exact same affliction. We're all going to die mm -hmm. at some point. And so death is something that 100% happens every single day. Well, when somebody dies, and they leave their property or whatever the case may be, a lot of times the heirs for those properties are out of state, out of country, out of what, that's a how, we don't want anything. Bank. In fact, uh, for, in order for us to get our inheritance, somebody's got to sell that house and they need to sell it really fast, right? We don't care, just, just get rid of it, right? And working with an attorney, a probate attorney, and just say, get rid of the house. That's one. Uh, last time I checked, about 50% of marriages end in divorce. Another thing that's kind of almost certain, right? The very distressful situation, loss of job. We're still, you know, record high unemployment levels in a lot of markets. You lose income, you lose a job. You need to move quick. I need to downsize. I need to get out of this thing. I don't have time for all the nonsense. Um, so think about all of the crisis situations that are just a part of the human experience: death, divorce, foreclosure, bankruptcy, loss of job, recent, you know. Um, I, I've got to move out of town. I, I got transferred. Um, unforeseen medical bills. I mean, there's all kinds of things that happen every single day in somebody's life. And a lot of times they have equity in a property. They have whatever the, you know, they got, it's all locked up. They're affected. They are cash poor, but equity rich. They've lived in a house for 20 years, but any, any wealth they have is tied up in the house. So they can't make the payments, but they can realize some payday if somebody will come in and just help them. And so we actively market to people that are in situations where they potentially want to sell their house like that. And no, it's definitely not right for everybody. But, you know, again, statistically speaking, 35% of all transactions, real estate transactions in the United States today are being done with cash. Hmm. And I can assure you when somebody writes a check, they're expecting to buy at a discount. Nobody pays retail and pays cash. So you could argue that about 35% of the market, this is a really good place that they like to go and just get rid of their house. And so um, we teach people to come in and, and help people out of very stressful situations. And look, I'll pay you all cash for your house. You don't have to spend another dollar on it. You don't have to make another payment on it. We'll do all of it. We'll even, a lot of cases, we'll pay your moving expenses, whatever you need to help you move on with your life and get this off your plate. And then when we get some type of uh, deal put together that, that works for everybody, we, again, 35% of the market are cash buyers. We've marketed to these people. We have relationships with them. And we turn around and say, here it is. Here's something I've got. It's if as simple as a one-page document to assign that contract to you? One-pager. Mm -hmm. One-page legal you? document. And they are now the actual party in the transaction. And you're out of the way. Yep. And most of the time, you're helping them anyways, like divorce. Uh, if that court-appointed real estate agent get gets a hold of that property, they're, they're not getting anywhere near market price. 
Yeah. I mean, it, it's always, you know, the human experience is extremely fascinating, but um, money loves speed. And so people that need to move quick um, and they're not emotionally attached to a house, again, you're looking for, you know, the, uh, I'll put it to you this way, you know, to be a really good, successful wholesaler or real estate investor, you are making roughly about 20 to 25 offers to, to even get a single deal done. So you're failing 95 to 99 percent of the time, but you only have to be right once. You know, once is a ten, twenty thousand dollar payday to you, uh, and so it's a game of attrition. You just have to keep trying to help as many people as you can, and when one or two fall through through the cracks every week, then you're you know you're doing very very well in this business. And of course, this is the multi million dollar question, but what best practices do you have for finding these distressed sellers? Um. The, the single most effective way to find these stellar, uh, the sellers now is it all begins with the data. So we live in an information age. There's more data available now than there has ever been. And, you know, we've kind of been at the forefront of that for the last 10 years. Um, you, can, you can get extremely targeted with your very specific marketing, right? So we can tell uh, through algorithms and through data mining who are people that are most likely in a situation that they could use our help. And then from there, we will market to them using direct mail. Uh, we'll market to them using Facebook retargeting and we will market to them a lot of times doing cold calling. Uh, and then a new kind of phenomenon in the last year is just doing these you know, one-to-one -one text messaging with them. Because a lot of people respond to text better than they respond to a phone call. And um, through those channels to very targeted people, that's how you generate all the leads you'll ever, you'll ever need. And this is the service you provide, correct? With your correct. company? Correct. I think you might uh, be converting a client over here, Kent. You're pretty good at this, man. <laughs> <laughs> so how have you seen the market evolve because of everything going on with COVID and the pandemic? Because I know real estate right now, it's, it's I mean, inventory is hot. I, it, it's, it's flying off the shelves, right? So what, what is just kind of your state of the union when it comes to real estate and everything going on? Well, kind of like I opened with, right? I mean, don't ever, don't believe you're anywhere near as good as, you know, the numbers might think, might con you into believing right now, right? You'd have to be kind of um, a moron not to make money in this particular market, which is very indicative of the way that was back in the late 2000s. Um, I would say that, that when you're operating in the secondary market, like we are, it is not a, it is not about inventory. It is about it is about being a very very good marketer and a very very good person at listening and helping people convert um, their property into a transaction that works for everybody. As long as you're good at those two things, you're never going to have an inventory problem, right? Um, because you're targeting the right people with the right messaging and you're having the right conversations. The retail market is, and, and again, that is going to be true whether we're in a buyer's market or a seller's market, whether it's white hot or you're all the way down. There's always buyers and sellers in every cycle, period. In fact, when the market falls, there'll be more cash buyers because as far as they're concerned, there's blood in the streets and they're going to want to buy everything they can because they believe they're buying at a discount. And so it'll just get hotter when it, when it, when it finally does come off. So the skill you have to have in order to weather both of these storms up and down is be really, really good at marketing and be really, really good at listening and helping people convert, right? You've got those two things, those two skill sets, you will, they'll, they'll, you will be able to navigate ups and downs without any problem. Where do I think it's going? Well, for sure it's going down at some point. Um, can I, do I have a crystal ball and have any idea when? No. I mean, I've got every real estate expert in the world, including myself a year ago, thought that we were about to have a, a huge glutton of product hit the market because everybody's trying to sell their house and exactly opposite happened. Everybody sat tight. You know, everybody that was potentially in the market to sell decided, you know, I'm not going anywhere. Not only am I not going anywhere, but I don't want anybody even in my house. And so what was, you know, could have been millions of homes hit the market was a, a few thousand. And so that's why you see supply has shrunk so bad and demand goes up because everybody's fighting over the same houses. It won't always be that way. And it probably won't be that way long. It might be another 12 months, you know, on it. But um, again, get out of the headlines. Nobody cares. As long as you're focusing on people that are in distress because they exist, then you'll, you're playing right in the middle. 
Perfect. So for those that have reached that next level that are real estate investors or accredited investors, I see a lot of what you're doing with the real estate Avengers. You know, what's the next play for, that you would recommend for somebody going into investing? Um, learn the difference between income and wealth. I've become extremely passionate about um, creating generational wealth, right? And I wish I, I wish I fundamentally understood what I understand today. I wish I understood it just 10 years ago but I didn't. Um, so I've educated myself a lot on how to create massive, massive wealth in these markets. And I'm not talking about $10 million. I'm talking about two, three, $400 million. Um, if you don't understand the effects of passive, uh, uninterrupted compounding interest, then you, you're already probably behind. My advice to everybody, you know, we're now doing these events called the Real Wealth Initiative, where we're showing super successful people exactly how to go and get into the seller finance game and how to understand their financials, how to understand net worth, how to really do things that, that will move the needle in a profound way in your life. Um, that's what I advise anybody to do, right? It's cool to run a business. Don't get me wrong. It's cool to be on top and getting money, but it's a hell of a lot cooler to, you know, look up in five, 10 years and realize that you have created massive, net worth, massive $50 million in net worth in a matter of five years by just being really, really smart with what you're investing in, how you're investing it, and how you're creating these enormous returns that don't get interrupted and they constantly compound. Talk us through this uh, whole seller finance game. You brought it up earlier and I said, I'd like to explore it a little bit more. Uh, so here we are bringing it up again. Yeah. So, so where we are in the market right now is that uh, in December of this year, you know, we just talked about the market's going to continue to basically be flat or go up a little bit. The same time that's going on, Fannie Mae released a national press release saying that they were going to pull out of the lending pool this year, $1.4 trillion. Mm -hmm. so let me do the math. In 2020, they loaned out $4.1 trillion in single family homes. This year, they anticipate loaning out 2.7. Mm -hmm. So they're going, the market's going to go like this. The availability of credit is going to go like this. And so again, looking at it from a very simplistic way, where's the, who's going to fill the $1.4 trillion gap? And somebody's got to step in there. How are people going to buy houses uh, at the same pace if there's no money to buy them? And the way that's going to get done is through seller financing is guys like us that understand that, Hey man, let me go buy a house or I'm just going to use round numbers because the math plays out very simple, right? But if I can go buy a house for $50,000, and last time I checked, there were 17 million of those houses in the United States. Um, if I go buy a house for $50,000 and I can turn around and sell that house instantly for $99,000, which I can because I'm offering seller financing. Um, they can't get a loan anywhere else and people want to own where normally I would take that house at $50,000 and put a renter in there. But the moment I put a renter in there, I still have all the risk. Think about it. I own the property. I am responsible for taxes, insurance, maintenance, everything, right? Um, but if I, put, if I take the property down and I put a borrow in there, they are the owner of the property. They have all the risk. I'm now the bank. Hmm. You know, if you think about it, the bank doesn't care about your taxes, insurance, or your maintenance on your property or anything else, right? They, all they know is you owe us a mortgage payment every month and you better pay it. Or we're going to come and get the thing. And so when you can shift that kind of risk from being a landlord over to being the bank, it's a really, really attractive thing. But when you look at the math, it gets even more attractive because if I buy it for 50, I sell it for 99 and I tell somebody they're going to have to put a 10% down payment. So let's just put 10 grand. I'm effectively, my cost basis in a deal now is $40,000. If I'm at $40,000 and then closing costs and everything else, I'm probably in it at 45, but I have a $90,000 mortgage on the thing, right? And so if I write an 8% interest loan, well, my 8% interest is on the 45 that I have my cost basis, but it's also on that spread of the other 45 because it's a $90,000 mortgage. So 8% interest on mine and the other is a 16% return on my money. 16% return on my money. And oh, by the way, that's a 30 year note. Now, if you want to just go and you know blow your mind, just go and plug it into a, any kind of financial calculator and see what happens when you take a $40,000 note 
or $90,000 note at 16% or at 16% return compounded over, over 30 years, compounded over 30 years. And you will see why this is clearly the most profitable thing you could ever do right now to change your wealth picture. Because going back to the very important thing that I said earlier, uninterrupted compounding passive interest, you're just getting paid and you're going to make 16 points every year, for 30 years. I mean, I'll tell you exactly what that is right here. Oh, of course, on. now you're the one running the risk of a, a buyer defaulting on what I guess your mortgage, if you will. Okay, um, so so think about it. Let's say that happens. Let's play it out. Somebody defaults on their mortgage. I'm in the deal for forty thousand dollars less whatever they've already paid me. Mm -hmm. So they've made their their payment on that note. By the way, is seven hundred forty seven dollars, right? So it's a, let's just call it eight thousand dollars a year. They made three years worth of payments to me before they default. They've, I've collected $24,000 there. So now my cost basis in this deal is 16 grand. Mm -hmm. So they're handing me back a $90,000 asset because I'm foreclosing. Sure. My cost basis is $16,000 in it. I'll just go do it all over again. Go sell it again for 99. Now give me another $10,000. Now I'm in the deal for six grand, Fuck. right? I mean, this thing is just a, it's a machine. And I would highly encourage anybody that if, if you want to understand how to get really wealthy, then you need to educate yourself on that. And, and this is for the accredited investor? Because I'm, I'm thinking through- Oh, this has nothing to do with being accredited. So anyone can do this? Anybody could. could piece a deal together? Yeah, anybody could do this. You can need the education and it's, sure. not, it's not conceptually hard to learn. Got to get around some people like myself and my partners that understand this thoroughly now. Um, but once you understand the basic concepts, um, it's just like doing any other real estate transaction. <laughs> Quite frankly- you know, if you're a wholesaler out there right now, you should know how to do this because every deal you come in, you should be presenting two offers. Here's my all cash price. And here's the way I'll buy the price. I'll buy the house from you on terms. And you make the seller do financing for you. Speechless. <laughs> Dustin, we're going to have a conversation after this, man. You're a marketer. We should uh, <laughs> put some stuff together or worst case scenario, just uh, buy Kent shit because he's got it all figured out. Right. If you don't understand something, just surround yourself with the people who do. Kent, uh, brother, we appreciate you so much for being on the show. We're, we're coming up on the hour here, but before we let you go, we have to end with our signature question. And then of course, we'll let the people know where they can find you. But Kent, being that this is the Dedication to Excellence podcast in your own words, what does it mean to live a life in dedication to excellence? Focus on time. It is not about money, my friends. Focus on having the option of controlling and owning your own time. You focus on that, everything else will kind of get out of the way. You focus on money. My, in my world, uh, it's a very, very slippery slope. You focus on creating options, the money will come and it will come in droves. So Ken has said the word time about 942 times on this show. I would call that a clue. The sign behind him says the time is now. So uh, for one last time, the theme of this show is time and Kent, we appreciate you so much, brother, for being on here. Before we let you go, can you just let the people know where they can find you, uh, follow your journey, and of course, yeah, sure. um, just hit me up on social. I'm on Instagram, Facebook at Kent Clothier. You can always go to kentclothier.com. Um, you know, you guys alluded to it. If you ever want to learn about, uh, certainly about one of our, you know, wealth building events, feel free to hit me up, and I'll I can always send info to you guys, and I'd be happy to share it with you guys as well. Um, Anybody, any way and every way I can help somebody, just, you know, reach out. Don't be bashful. Kent, one more time. We appreciate you, man. Keep killing the game, brother. I'm excited to see what, uh, what evolution of your business happens next because something tells me that you're not done producing more value for the world. So, uh, again, appreciate you stopping by. You On behalf it. of myself and Dustin and the rest of the Dedication to Excellence audience, we appreciate you all. If you haven't already, subscribe, leave a review, and we'll catch you on the next episode. We out. Peace. Peace. Thank you.